Good morning. If you're just now joining us online, please let us know you're here by commenting below or filling out um, that attendance log so that we can connect with you. Over um, these next few weeks, uh, starting last week, uh, we are in the midst of a series called On the Right Path, which is a series all about discipleship. And so you'll see all of our vacation Bible school decorations are still up because we're using the key words from that event, um, love, trust, faith, joy, and hope. I think I got the order correct there. Um, And so each week, we're going to be looking at these different words and talking about how um, that applies, how that lights our path to being a disciple of Jesus Christ and to going out and to making disciples in his name. And so this week, we're focused on trust. I don't know about you, but, but trust is something that I've always struggled with from a young age. And I think part of that is just growing up with a difficult family life. I had a father who was an alcoholic, and so sometimes I didn't know if we would have lights in our home. Sometimes I didn't know if my dad would, would take my birthday money, and so I had to hide it. And so I've always grown and struggled with who I can truly trust, And even, I mean, Aaron would probably tell you that that sometimes I don't trust him fully. I don't don't just let go. I'm, I'm, I'm very guarded, and I always have been. And so it's taken a lot of prayer and time to be able to come to a place of trusting another let alone trusting God. I have a photo that Craig's going to put up here. Um, Several years ago, I was a youth director when I was in college, and so we took the kids on a youth retreat, um, and there was like an obstacle course sort of thing, or a challenge course, and there were different stations, and we had to climb over walls, and it, it was a team building activity, but one of the things we had to do was a trust fall. Has anyone ever done a trust fall? Some of you. And I think I've shared this story with you before, but I think it's been a while. So you can see that's me up on the platform uh, when I was in college. My hair was a lot shorter then and not a fake color. That was my natural color. Um, and so my feet are, are right about the, the, the spot of other folks' heads, right? So I'm about four or five feet off the ground. And so they told us, you need to stand there and and cross your arms, and when you fall backwards, do not bend, right? Trust those below you will catch you. Well, you can see what happens next after I fall. I bent. And if you can see the guy in the middle, his name is Clint, you can see his face. He's like, all my weight was on Clint, And so he's like really struggling because I've just fallen from four or five feet off the ground pretty much solely on his arms. I didn't trust the process. I didn't trust the guy telling me what to do. I didn't trust those below me to catch me, even though they did. But I think most importantly, I didn't really trust myself. I didn't trust my body to stay straight. And so I fell. And I kind of failed a little bit. But thankfully, those who were around me caught me. Those who were with me, even though I didn't necessarily trust them, they still still fulfilled their promise. I think this is true for us on our path of discipleship. God is there calling us, leading us, guiding us, But here's the thing about God. Even when we break our promise, even when we break our commitment, even when we fall away, God never does. I think it's really hard for Christians to truly trust in God. A lot of us come to church, we say, yes, we believe in these things, We believe in what God is doing. We believe in the church and that we should should come and we should worship and we should go out and we can serve others. 
But there, there's always a point or a line that we draw in the sand where we don't give just this much over to God. And I know that's true for me. Aaron and I will talk all the time about, about the United Methodist Church itineracy, right? I'm called to, to go where the bishop sends me. And we'll, we'll, we'll strategically plan and say, well, I, I, we, we, have to, we have to talk about where, where, where we could move or how long we want to stay. And, and we're putting all sorts of stipulations on God's call when in reality we're supposed to trust. Now here's the thing about trust. You can't have trust without fear and uncertainty and risk, right? Right? Like for me, trusting in the process means I have to trust other people. I have to trust that the bishop is actually discerning God's will. I have to trust the cabinet, that they have the interest of the churches and their pastors at heart. And so there's risk involved, right? You can't trust without risk. Otherwise, it's not really trust at all. If there's nothing at stake, if there's nothing to lose, then are you, do you even need to really trust someone? So as we dive in this morning, um, we're going to be looking at some disciples. Now, not the 12 disciples of Jesus. We're going to actually look at some folks in the Old Testament, um, but I think that they have some lessons of discipleship to share with us as well. And so this week, we're going to look at the story of Esther. Have you ever read the whole book of Esther? Some of us? Any of us? Has it been a while or was it recently? It had, been a, a, it had been a while for me when I started preparing for this week. And so as I reread the book of Esther, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that's what happened. So we're going we're gonna to kind of summarize this. But before we start, um, as we look at Esther, Queen Esther, she comes to this place where she has to trust. She has to take kind of a, a leap of faith. She has to trust in God and stand true in her calling, even though it comes at great risk and potentially the loss of her life. The story of, of, of Esther in the Bible is actually the story of, of a Jewish celebration called Purim, if you've ever heard of it. Um, Pur means the lot. And so in, in the book of Esther, they, they tell you exactly where Purim comes from. Later in Esther, it says um, that the enemy of all of the Jews, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, um, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast Pur, that is the lot, to crush and destroy them. And so Esther comes before the king, and we'll talk about what she does. But the end of the story is even though the, the, the enemy of the Jews was out to kill and destroy them, they gained relief from their enemies. Their sorrow had been turned into gladness. Their mourning had been turned into a holiday. And so that's the story of Purim, which is, which is why it's in the Old Testament which is why it's in the Hebrew Bible, because it, it shares this, this important celebration of the Jews. If you read the book of Esther, one thing you might notice, God is never mentioned. Never, not once. No one prays to God. No one really talks about God. We know some of the characters in the stories are Jewish, so we know their, their religious affiliation. We know kind of what they believe, just knowing that fact. We hear some stuff about fasting, but there's no direct conversation with God. There's no dialogue where God speaks, where God tells Esther what to do. And sometimes it kind of brings me comfort that this book exists. Because I don't know about you, I have never audibly heard the voice of God. And I think that's true for many of us. Sometimes our daily walk with God is just about trusting who we're called to be. So the book of 
of Esther kicks off um, with a with a guy um, with, with kings or uh, with, with the king, um, and and we hear at the beginning that that God's chosen people are now in exile. The Jews, Jerusalem has been conquered. It's been taken into chains into to Babylonian captivity, and the Persians are ruling. But there are still some Jews who are left, who have kind of been scattered around. Some have have been allowed to return to Jerusalem, um, and some have married and settled in the homes in the lands of Susa, um, and and they're, they're a recognized minority in the heart of this powerful Persian empire. And so we meet Queen Esther, who is actually an orphan. She's also a female, and so she is a nobody of nobodies, right? She, she's a Jew under Persian rule, and she has no family. So that kind of sets up our story. As we open chapter one, we hear that the king is going to throw this huge party for everyone. And if you read in the, this book, it says, there were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple silver rings and marble, marble pillars. There were couches of gold on the mosaic pavement. pavement. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. All right, so this is a fancy place. It's a fancy party. And so the king, he's drunk. He's hanging out with his buddies. And he's like, hey, my wife, Queen Vashti, she is lovely and beautiful. And I want all of you to see her. And so the king calls for his wife, and he says, hey, I want you to come before my royal court, show off your beauty. And the queen says, no, like a good, strong woman does, right? No, you're not going to parade me in front of your friends. I'm not going to dance for you. Well, the king is not happy about this situation because no wife should ever say no to her husband, according to the king not according to Pastor Cassie. <laughs> and so the king gets mad, and, and some of his advisors say, well, you just need to get rid of her. Because if people learn that the king's wife doesn't obey, what do you think's going to happen to all our wives? They're going to stop listening to us too. So the king's like, yeah, I like this idea. We got to get rid of her. So they decide instead, they get rid of her, and they decide to bring in a new queen. And so they're going to find women, virgins, from all around the land, and people are going to bring them in and parade them in front of the king's servants, and they're going to pick a new queen for the king. This is really terrible, okay? I'm just going to say that up front. This is not okay stuff, but it's just what happens in the story, right? Right? So Esther is this guy named Mordecai's cousin. And Mordecai is a Jew, but nobody knows he's a Jew, right? Because he's living under Persian rule, and the Jews are in the minority. So he doesn't want to tell anyone who he is. And so he brings his cousin Esther. And Esther comes, and she is beautiful, and she is selected to be the queen next to the king. And there's a whole lot more stuff that goes on. But eventually we find out that some of the king's servants, um, they, they plot, they, they, they want to kill the king, right? This is like every Game of Thrones episode ever. And so the king finds out because Mordecai tips him off, okay? And he does that by telling Esther, who tells her husband, what has happened. Then... The king decides to elevate this guy named Haman into his royal court. And so he is in charge, and he says, I want all the king's servants to come and to bow before me. Well, as a good and faithful Jew, who are you supposed to bow before? God, right? You don't bow before men, you bow before God. So Mordecai is kind of in this predicament, right? He's a Jew, nobody knows he's a Jew. 
But he's been asked to bow before this new guy, and he's like, oh, man, I can't do that. And so he refuses. Well, this pisses Haman off. He's like, I'm not about that. Really, he gets really mad, which is why I use that word, because he gets so mad that he's like, I'm going to not only kill him, I'm going to kill all of the Jews. All right? So Mordecai's in trouble, all the Jews are in trouble, which means who else is in trouble? Queen Esther, right? She is in a tough spot. She's hiding her identity, but eventually they're going to figure this out. If her cousin's a Jew, she's probably Jewish too. And so Mordecai pleads with her and says, Esther, I need you to go before the king. I I need you to go tell him to stop this madness. Stop hurting our people. Because eventually, you're going to get hurt too. And Esther is nervous. Because she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know how to be. She doesn't want to go before the king because she knows if she goes before the king without being summoned, she could be killed. So she really is in a tough spot. She has a choice. Do nothing and be harmed or do something and be harmed. Many of us are often in the same predicament too, right? If we do nothing, bad things will happen. If we do something, bad things will happen. So what is the right choice? Well, that's where we come into our text for this morning. We're going to be in Esther chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verses 9 through 17. It says, Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him this message for Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's providences know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself, I haven't been called to come into the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you, if you keep silent at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you will have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. After that, I will go to my king, though it is against the law, and if I perish... I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him. This is the word of God for the people of God. So Esther's made a bold choice, right? She's like, all right, I will do what you've asked. I will go before my king. If I perish, I perish. How much trust does she have to have in who she is called to be, to be able to say that. She is putting herself at great risk. And yet, she knows that she has been chosen for such a time as this, to speak out against injustice and oppression for her and for God's people. She knows she's called, she's scared to go, but eventually she does. Well, the rest of the story, we kind of spoiled it at the beginning, right? Esther goes in front of the king, and eventually the king learns that it's Mordecai who, who, who found out about the plot to kill the king, so he loves Mordecai now. And Esther's like, well, who, uh, or the king's like, ask Esther, who, who, whose plot was all of this? And she says, well, it was Haman's, right? So the king gets mad at Haman, 
and Haman is hung. All right? So the bad guy is defeated, the good guys win. Now, I just want to say, if you read on in Esther chapter 9, there's quite a bit of violence that happens, um, and it, it's really difficult to understand, and that is a whole other sermon for another day, um, so we can talk about that at a later time, but it, but it is a difficult part of the passage. But inevitably, by trusting, Esther becomes victorious, Right? The Jews are able to be saved. God's people then celebrate what God has done. And so I think for us, there are several questions that this raises. First, about our identity, and also about our calling. I think sometimes we really struggle to identify who we really are. I know I I often think of this myself. Who am I first? I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a pastor. I'm an American. I'm a Lexingtonian by heart, right? I have all of these things that compete with one another in my life. But ultimately, our identity rests in Christ, We are beloved children of God. And Esther knows this too, right? She's a Jew. She's also an orphan. She's a nobody in the eyes of the world. She's a queen with no real voice or political power. But ultimately, she is God's chosen to save God's people. And so I think this is true for us, too, that we need to recognize that, that first and foremost in our lives, even when it's scary, even when it's hard, even when it's risky, we are Christians first. We are God's beloved children. And sometimes, guess what, that conflicts with other values that we might have, either in our family or in our neighborhoods or in our country. And we have choices to make. But it also has to do with our call. And God has placed a call on all of us. We have all been chosen by God for such a time as this to do something courageous and bold. We may not know what it is yet. But God has chosen you to speak out against injustice and oppression. God has called you to care and love for other people, even if it puts yourself at risk. Being a disciple is risky business. Will you trust in who you are and who God has called you to be? Let's pray. God, we give you thanks um, for your word and for this, this story that you have offered to us in your holy book. God, as we continue to to wrestle with who we are and where you have called us to go and who you've called us to be, oh God, let us put all of our trust in you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.